I swear these people must have some sort of advanced intelligence or notification system to alert them of a new opportunity to diminish the rights of Americans, because these days I don't even learn about mass shootings by breaking news reports anymore. I learn about mass shootings by some politician's immediate preconceived statement about how making myself helpless at their enforcement is the obvious solution to stop them before the facts are even assessed. The solution is already prescribed. Whenever a shooting happens, there is an immediate parade of politician and activist tweets, all of the same general theme. How can I use this to concentrate my power? How can I use this to push my own policy preferences? How can I use this to ban stuff I don't like, whether or not that stuff even has anything to do with this particular incident at all? And oftentimes, as in this case, those are the thoughts before the criminal is even caught. They have more to say about taking from you and criminalizing you than they do about finding the guy who actually committed the crime and remains on the loose. Or at least he was at large when I recorded this video. As of late Friday night, though, police now say they found the guy dead of an apparent suicide. Almost immediately after the news of the latest shooting broke, California Governor Gavin Newsom tweeted a lecture for the state of Maine about their policy failures, oddly blaming only Republicans, despite the fact that Democrats control both houses of the legislature and the governor's office in Maine, and as though California's policies have produced any positive effect anyway. According to the Precious Gun Violence Archive, the source with highly questionable methods that's constantly cited to say that there are hundreds of mass shootings every year, including some 560 plus at current count in 2023, California has the third most mass shootings of any state, 41 behind only Illinois and Texas. And sure, plenty of that is a function of sheer population. California is a big state, but even when you measure per capita, why are mass shootings in California just as common as they are in Florida or Nebraska, states that don't bother with most of California's gun control nonsense. If Gavin's point is correct and his pet laws obviously stop mass shootings, well, why are mass shootings still happening in California at a rate comparable with any other state? And even where these laws are already in effect, of course, they're still not good enough. Dang it, we just didn't word them quite right, or we just didn't enforce them quite right, or sometimes we'll just pretend there aren't even laws at all. Shannon Watts over at the hilariously named Moms Demand Action wants Maine to adopt a law that's already federalized in banning domestic abusers. Domestic abusers are already banned everywhere from gun ownership, and there's no evidence this guy was one anyway. But if only Maine had a red flag law, then that would have stopped this guy too. Except Maine does have a law to that effect. In what they call a yellow flag law instead, Maine allows police to petition a judge to remove weapons from a dangerous person. The shooting suspect, Robert Card, recently made a threat to commit a shooting at a National Guard facility, and police did not exercise their authority to confiscate his weapons under that law. But of course, enforcing existing law to catch criminals isn't the point. The point is a new stack of law to criminalize you. And so the president's graphics interns are hard at work making the theft of your constitutional rights as artistically pleasing as possible while deploying the most unpleasing person possible to do the messaging. We must continue to speak truth about the moment we are in. In our country today, the leading cause of death of American children is gun violence. Unpleasing according to public opinion, I mean. Plenty pleasing in her strategy for upward political mobility to this office, of course. But what they don't tell you is that by children's deaths, they actually mean late teen gang violence in Chicago and Baltimore, the primary driver of that misleading statistic. Not to mention that claim discounts abortion, the overwhelming form of child death by a factor of 100 to 1, that they actually support. But of course, the solutions are so easy, they say, and wow, very conveniently, those solutions just happen to be theirs, too. Karine Jean-Pierre says, if you would like all of these mass shootings to cease, well, it's as simple as Congress just waving their magic wand and clicking their heels to make it so. And here's the thing, Speaker, Speaker uh, Johnson and 
all of the members on the Hill, Republicans in, in Congress, they have the ability to stop this. They have the ability to put forth legislation to deal with this issue. They can change this. They can help save lives. Well, forget the great theological question of why God allows evil, I guess. The much more pressing question is why Congress allows it, since their powers are even greater by the sound of it. And this week, the congressman from Lewiston, Maine, has apparently realized his own godlike power over the issue, too. He can stop it anytime he wants to. And so, lucky for you, he has decided to be the good guy to do that. His name is Jared Golden. He's been the congressman for Maine's second district since 2019. And he held a press conference on Thursday to declare that he's flipping on his prior position against a federal assault weapons ban. Because this event happened in his district. So now, he supports sending feds into yours. And sure, you are allowed to change your mind, but Listen carefully to the explanation here. It's not, I'm persuaded by new evidence or new reasoning that my prior position was incorrect. It's just something bad happened where people I know are affected by it. And so now you, someone thousands of miles away, have to be punished for it. Humility is called for as accountability is sought by the victims of a tragedy such as this one. Out of fear of this dangerous world that we live in and my determination to protect my own daughter, and wife in our home and in our community. Because of a false confidence that our community was above this, and that we could be in full control among many other misjudgments, I have opposed efforts to ban deadly weapons of war like the assault rifle used to carry out this crime. I only care about issues that affect me personally, in other words. That is not a position that should be respected or celebrated by anybody on any issue ever because it's not based on any principle. It is based only on selfishness. I never cared to ban murder until someone I know was murdered. I never cared to ban theft until someone I know was stolen from. If your positions are guided not by an underlying moral truth, but instead only to the degree that you personally are affected, that is not virtue. That is not a moral rule. That is just the quiet part out loud, actually. That is just a slimy politician openly telling you, I never cared about protecting your rights. I only cared about protecting mine. And of course, I'm not saying that owning an AR is or should be a crime like murder or theft. It's not. That's the congressman's new position, not mine. But even aside from his, I never cared about you until I got hurt stance, the logic of his proposed gun ban is completely backward. He says he was fine with the scary guns because he thought his community was safe. But now that he realizes his community is not safe, well, the scary guns gotta go. How does that make any sense at all? Shouldn't the reasoning be the other way around? The scarier the place, the scarier the gun you'll need to defend yourself. To use another major recent news story, let's say that you're at a music festival enjoying yourself when some Islamic militants start paragliding in from the sky, for example. In that situation, are you going to say to yourself, man, I sure am glad I don't have any scary guns to make this situation any worse, or are you going to be desperately scrambling to find any gun that you can? The scarier, the better, actually. But at least the congressman did something very rare in his profession. He took responsibility for himself. Now, sure, it may be completely misguided responsibility, but... It is at least a little refreshing to hear a member of Congress blame himself instead of blaming you for a change. The time has now come for me to take responsibility for this failure, which is why I now call on the United States Congress to ban assault rifles like the one used by the sick perpetrator of this mass killing in my hometown of Lewis and Maine. I ask for forgiveness and support as I seek to put an end to these terrible shootings. Well, if he's responsible as a member of Congress who wields Corrine Jean-Pierre's magic wand that could stop this at any point, and he didn't, I don't see why we don't arrest him right now for being an accomplice to this crime instead of creating new conditions to arrest other people across the country for having nothing to do with it. But fine. If we're going to go with this premise that Congress obviously has an easy button to delete this problem at any point, you must explain why Congress's easy button did nothing last time. Because recall, the federal government banned the manufacture and sale of so-called assault weapons 
between 1994 and 2004, a policy that had absolutely no meaningful effect on crime in this country, not according to me, but according to the Department of Justice. The DOJ commissioned a study to analyze the ban's effects. That study was published in June 2004. The study acknowledges the truth that the politicians never will. So-called assault weapons are so rarely used in crimes that a ban on them was bound to have little effect anyway, and it did. While the ban appeared to reduce the rare use of assault weapons in crimes somewhat, the decline in assault weapon use was offset by rising use of other guns equipped with large capacity magazines. And even if you want to ban these large capacity magazines, there is such an immense supply of them already circulating, it is a practical impossibility to make them disappear. While crime did decline overall through the decade of the ban, it started declining before the ban, and it continued declining after the ban. And so the study authors conclude, quote, we cannot clearly credit the ban with any of the nation's recent drop in gun violence. But maybe you think the feds are biased against gun control for some reason. Like, they're bent on preserving your rights despite the evidence. Well, it's not just the government's own study, though. There are several more. A 2020 meta-study, as in an aggregated study of studies on the issue, found inconclusive evidence, as in no effect, on assault weapons bans and firearm homicides. Other research published in Criminology and Public Policy in 2020, same conclusion, quote, assault weapons bans do not seem to be associated with the incidence of fatal mass shootings. But put aside the empirical reality of the data that consistently show that this policy does not produce the effect that they claim is a guarantee. Put aside the political reality that this proposal will likely not pass in the House, and even if it did, it will not break the filibuster in the Senate. Put aside the legal and the constitutional reality that even if this did become law, a Supreme Court that is finally giving some meaning to the Second Amendment will not let a ban on America's most popular rifle stand pursuant to case law that protects weapons in common use. Because if the most popular rifle in the country is not in common use, then nothing is. It is completely unnecessary to think about this as a statistician or a lawyer or any other alleged elite. Just think about it as the founding fathers did when they wrote that amendment in the first place, as just a guy with something to protect in a dangerous world with bad people who will try to take it from you. The fundamental truth that makes your self-preservation necessary. Every time this happens, we get the same debate. What caused this? How could this happen? It's the guns. No, it's the mental health. And of course, it is natural to try to explain it and to solve it. And I'm not even saying that there is no truth to either of those scapegoats. If we could perfectly institutionalize every crazy person, or if we could magically delete every weapon from the world, maybe we would see fewer killings. But blaming these scapegoats and seeking to delete them with inhuman perfection ignores the more fundamental reality. Evil exists. And Congress can't ban it because they aren't God, no matter how much they try to persuade you that they are. If you accept that basic reality about the world, evil exists. Well, then the next question is, what are you going to do when confronted by it? Will you be prepared and equipped or... Will you be frantically dialing some phone number for someone else to do that for you? And if your answer is, well, I won't do that confrontation myself, Congress will do that confrontation for me. Yeah, good luck. Of everything backward in the representative's convenient flip to the good guy side, that is the most backward of all of it. Because the more capable you are in solving problems in your life, the more likely those problems get solved. The more you outsource that problem solving to somebody else, the less likely those problems get solved. On an increasing scale, the further away you outsource it. So sure, maybe your mom can pick up groceries for you, or your dad can help you fix your car, for example. But try asking your city council for help. Multiply the weight times 10. Ask your state legislature for help. Multiply the weight times a hundred. Ask Congress for help. Multiply the weight times never. And that's the thing about a confrontation with evil. You don't have time to wait for help, let alone never. That's why there's wisdom in preparedness and foolishness in counting on someone else to be prepared for you. Particular foolishness 
and counting on Congress for that. Because by this guy's own admission, he never cared until it affected him. If he does not care until it affects him, why would he step between you and the evil into the line of danger where it affects him most? He won't, according to him, five minutes ago. If you count on the guy whose response is tears at a podium to protect you, well, that's exactly what you're going to get. Tears at that podium to remember your dead body because you thought such a person even could. Because if there's one thing that'll kill you faster than that stare down with evil, trusting a politician promising to protect you is about as lethal as it gets. Thanks as always for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Gab. That is at M L. Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chatting my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Goodbye.